All right, thank you. Um, all right, hello, welcome everybody. Um, just letting you know the webinar, like all our webinars are is being recorded. Um, this is our uh, war on youth, our fight against the war on youth. Uh, every second Tuesday uh, we meet. And um, before we go into what we have planned for today, I think I hear myself echoing a lot. I'm not sure if somebody else maybe is unmuted. Oh, cool, perfect, thank you. Um, and so before we go into the plan for the day, um, for the webinar, sorry, I still have my teacher, <laughs> teacher voice in my head. I uh, wanted to uh, just give some logistics. Um, basically, we do have uh, folks on mute. Um, you're not able to unmute yourself and uh, it's not because we don't wanna hear from you. Um, it's just because we've been Zoom bombed um, several times. Um, and so, um, so you are able to at least put in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat as well. And um, if, if for some reason people start Zoom bombing there, then, then we'll close it down. But, um, but that's the reason for right now we don't have folks um, unmuted. Um, however, it is, we do wanna hear from you. So if you want to say something, you have the raise hand button or you could even put it in the chat and then we'll go ahead and, and unmute you. Um, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it for that. And, um, and so, so basically now we'll just go ahead and start the webinar. Um, and so welcome to the War on Youth webinar. Um, in this one, basically, I uh, just wanna give you a brief background on what it means, what the War on Youth fight is and what are the programs we're targeting. And then we're gonna be um, hearing from um, the Palestinian Youth Movement and Anak Bayan as well. And um, we'll, uh, they can also introduce themselves um, shortly. Um, and so basically when we talk about uh, the War on Youth, um, obviously there's various wars on youth. Um, but this one in particular is looking at how uh, young people, particularly black and brown, um, Muslim, immigrant and indigenous youth are seen as a, are being treated as threats to national security. Um, so we know for the last 30, 40 years, the gang member narrative has been one of the most prominent um, narratives to criminalize uh, youth of color. And it continues to be. Um, but what we see now is this transition into T treating young, young people as, like I said, threats to national security. And uh, some of these programs um, that we are targeting, that we're going after, uh, one is called um, Countering Violent Extremism. And while on one hand it sounds something like, you know, that would make sense, that's the point for it to sound like that, um, the reality is, is that um, it's, it, it targets a youth, it targets families, and it was passed by the Department of Homeland Security. And um, in three major cities, um, Los Angeles being one of them, as well as uh, Boston and Minneapolis. And, um, and within this framework of the countering violent extremism is a, a smaller program. It's a set of FBI guidelines called Preventing Violent Extremism, which specifically targets K through 12. And, um, and with that, for example, there are indicators that the FBI has claimed that make a young person suspicious or on a pathway to becoming um, a, a violent extremist. Uh, some of those behaviors include being too much into your culture, um, expressing anger or frustration, feeling lonely, uh, being, in, um, being in poverty, being a migrant. And so obviously, um, you know, these are extremely problematic and further so, they're modeled off of a program in England called Prevent. And uh, Prevent in England has very similar, um, similar standards, but theirs is a lot farther ahead. They've already made um, anybody who works with youth uh, mandated reporters. Um, so that means by law, they have to report th some of those, uh, some of those you know, suspicious standards that I just stated. Um, and so this is what has built our fight against it. Um, seeing what ha seeing how it has manifested in England, and so when we got wind of this, um, we, we took it up, and we've been fighting it now for several years. And um, within CVE, which is Countering Violent Extremism, and PVE, um, is also um, a report that was released called the Black Identity Extremism. And that report, um, even though the label doesn't exist anymore uh, by the FBI, um, we know Black youth are still being targeted in that way. And even within that. It was stated that because black youth perceive us, that violence perceive, right? As if they imagine the violence that could make um, black youth more likely to become violent extremists. Um, and so 
these are the various uh, layers, the various ways we're targeting it. And one thing is that CVE manifests itself in many ways. Um, and there are currently and um, there are currently programs that aren't called CVE, but uh, that again are being implemented in, in those ways. Um, so just wanted to give that very brief um, background. Um, there's a lot more to it, um, but want to um, go ahead and move forward um, with PYM, the Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, and if there's any questions, um, please again, feel free to, to put in the chat. Um, you can um, raise your hand. So I um, want to go ahead and introduce um, Yazan from Palestinian Youth Movement. Uh, us, the coalition, we've been working with PYM now for, for a few years and um, have a lot of love, love for PYM. So I uh, so want to welcome them to the space. Uh, we've been, they've been really core to this uh, war on youth fight. Um, so I'll pass it uh, over to you, Yazan. Hi, Nadia. Thank you. Hey, to see you. Likewise. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, so my name is Yazan. I'm an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, I'm based between San Diego and Long Beach, um, and I work a lot, especially with Celine in the PYM on um, understanding the war on terror and sur surveillance um, and its relationship to Zionism, both in the U.S. and transnationally. So together, I think a lot of what we do is understand how Zionism um, and white supremacy really work together, especially in the US, like in a liberal sense, thinking of organizations like the ADL, um, to really normalize Zionism and to undermine repression, I'm um, sorry, to increase repression um, and undermine resistance to Zionism and other movements. Um, so I don't know, um, I'm happy to just jump in if that's helpful. Um, yes, and I'm, I, I can share your slides. I just need screen sharing permissions. Oh cool. Okay. Sorry, give me one one second. No. Um, comment. It's the it's my other Zoom that's here. The C Q U S S I N Y. That's where oh. I'll be. Okay. Oh. Give me one second. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Zoom. No. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so Nadia was talking a little bit about countering violent extremism. Um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with like the mechanism of countering violent extremism, um, but for like a really, really short breakdown of what countering violent extremism is, um, during the Obama administration, there was in his first term, there was an attempt to expand surveillance programs by securing um, informants directly to the government from communities that were directly surveilled um, by the war on terror. So specifically Arab Muslim, South Asian Muslim, um, Black Muslim communities. And their goal was, can we get community members to be informants to the government? Um, and at that time, there was surveys that were done by different federal work agents and workers of like, if we started to work on an informancy program to reduce extremism or reduce terrorism, would you participate? And a lot of community members were like, absolutely not. We won't work with any sort of federal agents. We won't be informants. We won't be rats um, for our community. And so there was this tension where the government was like, well, we need community relationships to be able to secure information on community to know when the next terrorist attack is happening, right? And we say that in quotes because most often they're referencing resistance. Um, and so uh, after a lot of back and forths and you have folks including like, um, what's her name, uh, Janet Napolitano, you have a few other folks who are really instrumental in thinking through what's the missing link. And the identified missing link was community partners. So the federal government at the time, the Department of Homeland Security was like, okay, if community members on the ground don't wanna serve as informants to us directly, what if we build relationships with the partners? So if we think of religious institutions, nonprofits, schools, uh, local police departments, right? If we think of these folks as community partners, the middle ground, what if the Department of Homeland Security just got a relationship with them? And by having a relationship with them, they would be able to learn about community on the ground without having to actually form that relationship. And so that's what countering violent extremism is in a nutshell. It's Department of Homeland Security approaching different religious and um, nonprofit institutions uh, academic institutions with funding 
saying, hey, you guys have a hard time getting funding because you service people that the government doesn't actually really care about. We will provide millions of dollars of grants to your organization if you agree to conditional grants that require you to report on community members and collaborate with the police and other federal agents on them. Um, and so that's a really, really basic breakdown of CVE, um, but that's how it tends to operate on um, the domestic level when we think of CVE in terms of social services. The thing is, a lot of times when we hear about um, countering violent extremism in the US context, it's really focused on that top left square. It's really focused on the social welfare aspect. So a lot of times community organizers and other folks who are explaining what CVE is, they'll talk about this is dangerous because it co-ops social welfare, it endangers our community to surveillance. Um, there were risk factors that Nadia named that are used to identify someone that should be reported to DHS by community partners. Um, but what's really overlooked is that countering violent extremism, especially when it first came out in the Obama era, was actually it's an entire bureau. And in that bureau, it's the countering violent extremism and counterterrorism bureau that also spearheads military strategy. They make the decisions about where peacekeeping operations will take place in the world. CVE is also um, part of legal policies that the United States has enacted, for example, something called Women, Peace and Security. Um, you also have repressive movements that come from CVE frameworks, um, and you also have academic institutions that really work hard to promote countering violent extremism. So if we think especially on an international level, countering violent extremism is actually this enormous project. In the United States military, they have stations, they have over 51 um, bases in Africa, the whole continent of Africa, for example. They have dozens in East Africa under the banner of countering violent extremism as well. Um, and so the reason I'm naming that right now is because it's really important to think of social welfare as one tool of countering violent extremism instead of the whole program. Um, when the United States military is um, repressing anti-US imperialism in East Africa, so in Somalia, when they call bombings on US military countering violent extremism, they put military agents there in response to quell those movements as a part of countering violent extremism. Um, and so these things all really work together quite consistently to keep countering violent extremism going. Um, so it's important to understand the programmatic history of countering violent extremism in the US as part of Obama, but it's by no means limited to the United States at all. You see CVE in Pakistan, in the Philippines, in Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, um, just to name a few places. Um, and it's all very much tied to US militarization of these different places around the world and relies heavily on UN partnerships with NGOs um, to make sure that every single possible way of repressing resistance movements is in action at once. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So this is a really basic example um, of CVE as like both a war instrument and social services. But in San Diego, um, we have one of the largest Syrian refugee populations in the US. Um, and we also have one of the largest Iraqi populations in the US. Um, and on the right is a picture of a woman who was participating in a program called um, Women at the Wheel um, by an organization called the Syrian Community Network. Um, and the Syrian Community Network applied for CVE multiple times. Um, the one in San Diego was actually denied, but they still did a lot of collaboration with DHS and a lot of their programming relied on countering violent extremist frameworks. So they weren't formally funded for this program by the feds in the same way, but they used a lot of the same frameworks um, to still police community in that way around CVE. And they offered a program called Women at the Wheel, where basically what they did was offer women a chance to get a driver's license, right? And it's all paid for, you get driver's license, you get driver's lessons for free, you get a car that you get to borrow from them that you use with them under their supervision, right? It's a really important program, especially for refugee women. Um, if we're thinking of um, PYM here, we work with the Mejdan Center a lot. We do a lot of refugee service work. Um, refugees rely on nonprofit services for every single part of their day, right? Most refugees will hit up five to 15 nonprofits a week. 
for things from legal services to support with programming to vocational training to medical assistance, right? Nonprofits are an integral part of a refugee's life. Um, so this programming is something that is really, really helpful to a lot of folks. Um, on the left is the US bombing of Syria in 2018. Um, and this was one of the biggest military operations in Syria by the United States at the time. And there were several Syrians who were displaced from this bombing and ended up in El Cajon, San Diego County, who were then serviced by nonprofits that were funded by CVE or by other institutions using CVE frameworks like the Syrian Community Network, right? And if we think back, that bombing of Syria was under the Bureau of Counterterrorism and Countering Violent Extremism, right? So it's not like CVE is a social welfare program that helps refugees who were displaced by war with an unknown cause. The same bureau that's providing the funding for the nonprofit services for these folks is the same bureau that's also in charge of bombing them out of their own countries. Um, so it's really important to think of that because a lot of the militarization in Syria is also a condemnation of anti-imperialism, right? There's a really, really intensive attack against Syrian leadership and against their partnerships with Iran and Hezbollah. Um, so even though we don't get to hear about all of these names all at once a lot, there's a very, very, very heavy imperialist tone to US um, militarization of Syria. And then the social services that are either offered in Syria by the US government or social services that are offered in the United States by the government to Syrian refugees. Uh, next slide. Um, and so just really quickly, um, I also wanted to touch on Palestine um, because um, Nadia had mentioned that there were um, frameworks that exist that are used to determine whether or not someone is a threat. So whether either threat assessments or risk behaviors or these different things. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that Palestine is one of the case studies that informed the creation of countering violent extremism. Um, so it, specifically, it's an exploration of Hamas and brotherhood um, and the binding ties of terrorism that exist. Um, and this theorization is called parochial altruism. And it basically means that people engage in terrorism or extremism, not because they have um, legitimate political concerns, but because they care about their friends and their family and they have friendships um, with people who are also terrorists. And th so these people enact suicide bombings or other militarized operations because they're doing it out of love um, for their kin, um, right? So it's a really reductionist approach or reading of political violence. And that's something that countering violent extremism does a lot. It takes away the political context of people it, who have legitimate political struggles, right? Um, so being anti-Zionist is not a legitimate thing. It's more likely that someone is enacting a suicide bombing because they care about their friend um, who is also um, perhaps working in the same militia, right? Like that's the framing. They completely depoliticize it. Also that it could be both, right? Like you develop really intensive ties with people because of your shared struggles. Um, and they also use this case study, and this is a picture of Al Khalil um, in English, I think it's Hebron. Um, it's one of the poorest um, parts of Palestine, the West Bank. Um, it's also one of the most politically active. Um, so it's a really, really classed, a really Islamophobic and a really, really um, anti-resistance lens that's being applied to Al Khalil to produce social science theories that are then used by CVE um, sociologists or policymakers or social workers who create theories to try to explain why people do extremism um, without ever getting into the political. So even in this case study, um, it's mentioned in passing that Palestinians um, have a qualm with their material conditions or that they're resisting their material conditions. Um, they're critiqued for their absolutism. So Palestinians who are angry at the idea of a two-state solution or of being denied the right to return if it means peace, right? These folks are called absolutists who are uncompromising. Um, so this is just an example of the relationship that CVE maintains with Zionism. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch about um, today, I think I, I think there's like five minutes left or 10, I'm not sure. So if anyone wants to let me know how much time I have. Um, but um, the is University of San Diego. So if we can go to the next slide. 
10 minutes, cool, okay. Um, so the University of San Diego in 2016 got um, about um, $600,000 in grants from the Department of Homeland Security to enact countering violent extremist programming in San Diego. Um, and University of San Diego is, uh, they have one of the largest, um, what is it called? Conflict resolution studies schools. Um, and they, it's called the Joan B. Croc School of Peace and Justice. Um, and so the University of San Diego, what they did with that funding and then other funding that they got. So this isn't just Department of Homeland Security funding, um, but they re-granted that money into four specific um, subfields. So first um, on the right is police collaboration. So the University of San Diego used some of their funds to build out interfaith coalitions with police and religious leaders. Um, and those interfaith coalitions basically put um, different imams from different mosques in communication with different religious leaders from different churches in communication with police. And then they created a, a streamlined online forum where people can directly connect to the police and call them with any um, concerns they have about community members. Um, they also held a huge data and surveillance um, conference in, also in the name of USD. Um, and they started holding monthly sessions um, between police and community members. Um, the next one is they subgranted three nonprofits that specifically work with East African and Arab Muslim refugees. Um, and a lot of the programming included pro police rhetoric. Um, so, for example, one youth was surveyed after he left one of the programs and he was saying, he basically said, um, and this was cited in a report by DHS. I'm so happy to be here and that I went through this program because I learned that I can trust in Syria, you can't trust anyone because there's no laws or order, but in the United States, you can trust police because they care about you, right? Um, and this is a refugee youth from Al Cajon. Um, and in general, most of the programming is very, very pro-police, um, emphasizes a lot on community relationships with whiteness. So there's a lot of cultural shaming that happens in folks who don't want to assimilate or don't want to learn English or struggle with it. Um, and then there's also obviously a lot of anti-resistance material. Um, the University of San Diego also funded professors to produce original research um, supporting their ideas of countering violent extremism. And it works really heavily to criminalize anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, anti-Zionist thought. Um, and they also commission students to do their research. So through classes that they offer on CVE, they'll get students who then will research someone who does countering violent extremism in the Philippines, for example, is one of the examples I have. Um, and they produce reports and magazines and host events talking about these things that get a lot of traction. And because it's an international school, like because they do peace and conflict studies, they also have this all over the world. So USD, for example, just some of those listed there, Kenya, Iraq, Bosnia, the Philippines, they do annual programming sometimes two to three times a year in other countries where they build out this rhetoric and framework with other universities in other parts of the world. So USD is viewed as a leader in that sense. Um, and so all of that research that they're doing, it's not just localized to San Diego or even just California. Um, they have really, really heavy influence. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. Um, so this first example is of um, a woman her name is Mosarat Qadim. She's from Pakistan and she did a woman peacemakers program at University of San Diego, which is an international fellowship. Um, and she specifically has founded organizations that um, empower mothers to de-radicalize their sons. Um, and so she like boasts that she's talked hundreds of men out of suicide bombings and other violent extremist acts. Um, when historically most of the attacks that she's referencing are against US military op occupation um, of SWAT and of other militarized, heavily militarized regions in Pakistan. Um, so she does a lot to really promote um, anti-violence, but it's coded because she's criminalizing folks who do um, military resistance um, without actually ever naming the US, for example, as an imperial agent. Next slide. Um, and then similarly, um, I don't want to name the person who went through the Women Peacemaker program from Mindanao um, because I've actually looked her up more and more, and I think that she's more critical of the programming than USD framed her as. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to, I, I just felt bad. I didn't want to throw her under the bus because I still haven't been able to figure her out. Um, but what USD did through her is they, um, Mindanao, which I know also Zaiji is going to be talking more about that, but through militarization, um, 
the USD developed relationships through this specific woman peacemaker um, and then created a lot of anti-armed resistance rhetoric. And then they were actually part of the, the quote unquote peacemaking process that led to the transition authority government um, in Mindanao. So um, there's a lot of really intensive um, tensions around anti-colonial struggle and armed resistance in Mindanao. Um, and this legislation that was enacted was pacification of some factions of the armed movement. Um, and USD was directly linked to that, right? So the reason I'm naming this as an example, um, it's a really brief example, but is because um, in their language that USD released through reports and then through this legislation, there was an intensive equalization of US imperialism, the militarization of the Filipino army of Mindanao and then anti-colonial struggle. So all of these people were like, you all contribute to violence. You are all bad people. Well, let's just find peace for everyone, right? Ignoring the fact that peace for some means death, right? Um, next slide. Um, and then last but not least, I just really wanted to touch on um, the current moment, um, because I think right now in the US context, we're seeing requests to expand um, domestic terrorism laws um, or policing um, in the name of white supremacy. So you see folks saying white supremacy is terrorism, we should police it the same way. Um, and I think it's really important to name that President Joe Biden is actually the founder of COPS, which is Community Oriented Policing Services. It's the grants program that's the predecessor to CVE. So this is these are the folks who, before CVE came out, were doing bicycle handouts from Minneapolis police to people in Minneapolis or things like that. Um, and I think just really naming that um, any tactic or any tool, right, that we're expanding is going to always go back to community. Um, and I think just thinking of Cointel Pro, um, I had an image on here, but I, I think I didn't push paste. Um, Cointel Pro originally named white hate groups as a group that they were targeting. So like white extremism has been targeted by um, the US for decades and right, it's always in performance, it's always in vain. Um, so I think really also just thinking about the relationship of liberal thought and liberal ideas to policing um, and what that actually means for our community members and war. Um, because liberal thought is really what drives CVE in the first place. It's what drives war, right? If we think of the co-optation of feminism. Um, so just thinking about that in this current moment as well is really important. Um, and then Selena, I know you just wanted to pitch really fast our work. That was incredible, Yazan. Um, thanks for presenting all of that in the in like 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, I just I wanted to share a little bit about the the local work we're doing to to organize against this. Um, we've you know, Palestinian Youth Movement, as Nadia said earlier, have been working with Stop LAPD Spine Coalition for the past couple of years um, to fight these countering violent extremism frameworks and programs. And currently, we're we're organizing a campaign. Um, to get these programs out of education because that's where a lot of these programs are being implemented. School districts are one of the community partners that the Department of Homeland Security has identified as a strategic community institution to, to build with in order to get educators to be mandated reporters on indicators of extremism. And again, when we say indicators of extremism, we're talking about things like being politically active and engaged. Um, you know, they're assuming that, you know, increased, for example, increased religiosity and politicization of Muslims leads to increased threat of terrorism. So looking at these really anti-Muslim, anti-Black racist indicators of extremism and integrating those into mandated reporting that educators are required to do. So this is what we're fighting in schools. And we want to invite you all to join our, um, our effort, our campaign, and um, for invite any Arab Palestinian folks on this call to join PYM. I'll link our email list. And uh, we will also link our campaign interest form um, to get CVE programs out of our schools. And we have um, our monthly meetings. These monthly meetings are more public facing where we do more educational sessions, but we also are, are um, implementing monthly uh, co coalition meetings for folks who are more interested in closely organizing um, with us um, against this. Um, every third Wednesday of the month is when we'll be holding our, our monthly meetings. Um, to strategize about how to get CBE programs out of our schools. And we also are working on an educator's pledge um, with some teachers um, following the, the UTLA pledge uh, two years ago, Stop LAPD Spine Coalition supported um, with the UTLA uh, in writing a motion that was unanimously passed against CVE and PVE in schools. So now that these programs are still being implemented in schools, we wanna follow up on that pledge and. Um, uh, and put out a statement from teachers against these programs. And of course, also we're continuing to work with students and high school youth um, and our community members. So just, you know, we, we're putting out an upcoming report um, on Zionism and surveillance in schools. 
Um, and we also have a couple of resources in addition to the uh, the educators pledge, including a few fact sheets and um, some graphics and power map and, and other materials that we want to um, be putting out more publicly. So we invite you all to join our campaign and maybe if Akil, if you want to drop the link in the chat, uh, folks can fill out that form. Um, and yeah, these are just the different ways folks can get involved. Again, you can join our monthly meetings, fill out our interest form to indicate which level of engagement you can participate in, depending on your capacity. Um, you connect us to your networks, you can request a workshop. Um, join our email lists and of course follow us on social media and we'll be updating um, on this uh, campaign on our social media pages. Um, thanks again Yazan and, and thank you all and um, yeah I'll pass it to do we want to go into the presentation or, and then do questions or do you want to have questions first? I I think it would be great if, um, yeah, if, if folks have any questions um, for, for Yazan or Celine. Um, that would be great. Um, either you can put it in the chat or if you'd like to um, and, um, put your hand up, we can unmute you as well. Is it okay if we can take the screen off because I can't see if anybody's raising their hands up? Yeah, yeah, give me one. Hand up. I know one way to do that is to um, uh, to click on the participants list, and I, I know that way um, you can see the hands. So just a couple comments over here. Uh, amazing work! Thank you all for all the insight and taking the time. Uh, and another one, great presentation. Thank you. Another one, thank you for the info. That presentation was dope. Nice. Awesome. I'm going to share um, Anak Bayan's slides in just a second. Uh oh. Sorry. One. Uh, maybe in the meantime, if uh, ZJ and Janine, if you all want to introduce yourselves real quick, and I'll pull up your slides. Oh, and Celine, can you like refresh the slides just in case? There might have something, something might have been added. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'll do that. Oh, well, since I'm unmuted. Um, hello, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Janine. I am the chairperson of Anakbaya in Los Angeles. And hello, everybody. I am BJ, uh, speaking on behalf of Anakbaya in Los Angeles, and I'm currently serving as the Secretary General of ABLA. So welcome. Thank you for coming on by. And I see that we're, our slides are up. That's awesome, that's great. Um, yeah, thank you for having us, uh, Stop LAPD Sign Coalition, and also uh, this collab with uh, Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, so just a little bit about ourselves. Um, we are a comprehensive national democratic mass organization uh, comprised of militant youth. Um, our main objective is to advocate, organize, and mobilize youth from all walks of life for, the na for national democracy in the Philippines. Um, and a basis for why we organize is um, we really want to organize, organize around the issues uh, surrounding education, jobs, land, land rights, um, and social services. Uh, and we recognize that these uh, current standing issues are long-term problems of Filipino youth, uh, which are inseparable from the three basic problems, uh, which we identify as imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucratic capitalism. So, you know, we are an overseas chapter of Anafine Philippines, right? So uh, where does that put us as diasporic youth uh, in the belly of the beast? Uh, essentially, we are byproducts of capitalism, you know, just capitalism in decay, capitalism desperately trying to survive by continuously extracting these resources from our lands and exploiting our people, perpetuating forced migration due to the economic conditions in the Philippines. So that is why we're here and that is why it's, it is important for us as youth living in the belly of the beast to really take action and organize. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, y'all, it's a little bit slow. It's Just lagging. There's no, the design is too bomb. No, it's too bomb. <laughs> so essentially um, what's gonna pop up on the next slide is that uh, we, 
truly struggle to end this type of society in the Philippines and aim to win the struggle for national democracy towards socialism in the Philippines. So that's what, the, what makes us a national democratic organization. And I will pass it on to Janine to introduce our quick political situation in the Philippines. Thank you, ZJ. So can I have the next slide, please? Or actually it could be, thank you. And so now we will be going into a political situation or to provide that much needed context on the direct impacts of US imperialism on the current conditions of Philippine society. And so we begin with some brief history. Um, and so we begin at the Philippine American War where the Philippines experienced a shift from colonial ruler from Spain to now the US. The US government failed to recognize Philippine sovereignty until 1946 when the Philippines gained its so-called independence. But we know the truth. The Philippines continues to be under US control. The Philippines is continuously being exploited for its wealth of natural resources and labor force that fuels the monopoly capitalist interests on a global scale. And even today, the Philippines continues to be a test site for US imperialism, more specifically in the form of state surveillance and military tactics. Next slide, please. Wow. And then just to touch on, um, kind of jump into the Philippine National Police um, and, you know, their, um, the way that they execute police brutality in the Philippines towards masses. Um, so Duterte, uh, President Duterte um, is notorious for um, giving, you know, shoot to kill orders. Right, um, especially and not being shy about it during press conferences, right, and not being shy about gender-based violence, right, uh, to where uh, his his cronies, these uh, the, these police, really execute um, pretty much uh, what he what he wants, like what he desires. These fear-mongering tactics, right, that have eventually led to about thirty thousand extrajudicial killings since twenty sixteen, since he took office, right. And then um, we can observe the police brutality in terms of the COVID-19 response. Um, as you know, um, the, the Philippines actually had like the highest uh, mortality rate, I believe, in terms of like COVID-19. Um, so fear mongering tactics being, um, you know, throwing, uh, throwing people who violate health measures into dog cages, making them sit outside in the sun, um, you know, for long periods of time. Uh, just to get, name a few examples, right? Um, and they're notorious for continuously protecting property and perpetuating violence towards farmers and, and peasant organizers. Um, and I believe that um, 50 unionists alone have been killed under Duterte. So he really targets uh, people who organize, right? Who organize and really fight for the masses. Um, another example is to, just to note, you know, um, a little trigger warning on with uh, police brutality, uh, Randy Ch Randy Chanis uh, was actually a peace consultant um, on agrarian reform uh, back back in the Philippines, and he unfortunately was brutally you know stabbed to death during a raid, and and the Philippine National Police uh, had no shame in mishandling the body and forcibly taking it, right, um, and. Uh, Kasama Randy, um, Comrade Randy, he really led the fight against landlessness and peasant struggle. Um, and these are just the very few examples that we have uh, to highlight the police brutality and how it is in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And yes, many of you have probably heard vaguely about Duterte's war on drugs, where he's trying to crack down on drug users and pushers. But in reality, he's just killing the urban poor and the most marginalized communities. This draws striking parallels between the war on drugs in the Philippines and in the US. Some of these similarities include the criminalization of people who use substances, especially working class communities or those who suffer from poverty. Uh, this also draws similarities from uh, increased militarization or increase, cr increases in policing rather than care for the community. These communities are vulnerable to substance use 
used to alleviate the stressors of their economic conditions, the government failing to meet their needs of the working class and those in poverty. But in the Philippines, they're currently fighting for a new system, a new system where the basic needs of the masses are met instead of prioritizing the greedy capitalist interests of the few. The Filipino people are striving for this new system, one that does not rely on fascist state repression, but rather a system that guarantees that all of our basic needs are met. Filipinos, they are clamoring for socialism. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and now we're gonna go into counterinsurgency and state repression. Um, so basically the question was, you know, how, what are we as, as Anafayan doing um, to really speak out against this? Um, we create, um, we create material for like social media and, and, and uh, hold situationers and also direct actions that really highlight and expose, um, expose these things. So if you can play the video, here's an example of our work as Anafayan Los Angeles. Uh, let me know if you can hear the audio. I'll try playing it. No, we can't hear it, unfortunately. Thank you. So, Celine, if you go, okay, do you want to stop this for a second? Um, if you go to your screen share to the bottom left, there's you want to check the sound. So, there's two boxes at the bottom left and bottom right. So if you check both those boxes, then the sound of whatever you're showing is gonna come through to the webinar. Okay, got it, got it. Philippine president has had a counterinsurgency. What is Duterte's counterinsurgency program and why is it dangerous? Every Philippine president has had a counterinsurgency program designed to end armed rebellions against its authority. It is modeled after and guided by the U.S. 2009 counterinsurgency guide, emphasizing a whole of nation approach. Okay, I'm Stan McChrystal, and I want to take some time with you today to talk about counterinsurgency and how important it is to us. And when we talk about counterinsurgency, we talk about it as a mission, often a military or combat mission. It's much wider than that. Under Duterte, this means an iron fist rule, such as Oplan Kapayapaan, Oplan Sauron, Oplan Kapanatagan, EO70, and the recent Anti-Terror Act of 2020. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has signed an anti-terrorism bill into law amid widespread opposition and fear. It will be used to silence critics. This means demonization of activists, mass arrest, extrajudicial killings or assassination of known activist leaders, and massive military operations. Last month, Ms. Ressa, the executive editor of a news website, Rappler, was arrested over an alleged internet libel case. Since the implementation of Oplan Kapanatagan, there has been a dramatic increase in attacks against activists and human rights defenders. Now, with the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, human rights violations are expected to further escalate. Oplan Tokhang, most infamously known as the drug war, has reached record numbers of extrajudicial killings, resulting in nearly 30,000 deaths of civilians. Duterte's counterinsurgency campaign also targets human rights organizations and advocates overseas. In 2018, the Philippine National Police established outposts in the West and East Coasts. We've learned that Bay Area law enforcement officers will no longer train members of the Philippine National Police Force because of a bloody war on drugs. There is Philippine National Police based here on U.S. soil. In 2019, the Philippine government organized speaking tours spreading accusations against activists and human rights organizations overseas as communist terrorist fronts. 
Recently, activists based overseas are being tagged online as communist terrorists, putting them at risk. Even regular OFWs merely expressing frustrations are targeted. Counterinsurgency does not address the roots of why Filipinos are expressing dissent against the Philippine government. Instead, it stifles dissent, eliminates avenues for Filipinos to criticize the government, and criminalizes efforts for social change. This is a cause for concern among Filipinos and non-Filipinos alike. An attack on human rights anywhere is an attack on human rights everywhere. On top of that, these human rights atrocities committed by the Duterte government are partly funded using our hard-earned tax dollars. From 2016 to 2019, more than half a billion dollars was sent to fund the Philippine military and police. In 2020, more than $2 billion worth of weapons were sold by the U.S. government to the Philippines. We can take action to support the efforts of human rights defenders and activists in the Philippines. First, share this video to help educate ourselves and others about the human rights situation in the Philippines. Second, advocate for the immediate suspension of U.S. military and security aid to the Philippines by passing the Philippine Human Rights Act. Tell your legislators why you care about the human rights in the Philippines and why they should support the Philippine Human Rights Act, or PHRA. Lastly, organize ourselves, our families, and friends. The more voices that are speaking out against the human rights crisis in the Philippines, the more impactful we can be. Sign up now and join the movement. Yes, that's solid though. Know, really grateful for um, you know our comrades who worked really hard on this video. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, we have folks with a bunch of dope skills. But anyway, so moving on to uh, the next slide. Yeah, so like red tagging is very real, and um, I've seen it um, happen to a very close close uh, Kasamas or friends of mine, right? Um, and we've seen uh, the, the toll that it takes on, on their mental health as well. And um, just really, really wanting to like emphasize that, that this is very real. We are in, we're uh, not separated from uh, the anti-terror law, right? Um, so the anti-terror law or the anti-terror bill was actually introduced last year, uh, back in July, or um, earlier last year, and then it was signed into law uh, in July, uh, July 3rd, uh, 2020, right? So essentially this piece of legislation is used as a basis to label any form of dissent as an act of terrorism. Uh, whether you are on Twitter expressing your opinion on President Duterte um, or um, you know, you're on Tumblr writing this uh, really sharp analysis on it, right? That um, could be labeled as an act of terrorism, right? Um, the broadness or the broad language that is used in the anti-terror law um, allows for that, right? Uh, so the, you know, this leads to online attacks, constant red tagging of um, organizers in the Philippines and also US-based organizers in our movement. We've seen a lot of uh, the national, you know, executive committee members uh, being targeted um, here in the US. Um, so they were pretty quick to do that. Uh, there are many repercussions um, due to this law, right? So uh, it can lead to life imprisonment without parole for engaging in acts or quote unquote, creating an atmosphere um, of, of fear, right? Spreading the message of fear, right? Uh, and again, just to note the danger of this broad definition of terrorism, uh, again, justifies abusive interpretations and allows like Philippine police and the military to surveil Warrantly, warrantlessly arrest and detain uh, dissidents for up to 24 days, right? Um, and it comes in, into question who's at the brunt end of this. It's workers, it's peasants, it's indigenous activists, it's um, even students, right? Who are uh, constantly trying to break away from that bourgeoisie um, um, mindset and, 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 and uh, that, you know, that class label, I guess you can say, in order to fight for uh, the rights of uh, the people, the masses. Um, and the next slide, please. So just to kind of touch on um, how quickly the anti-terror law uh, <laughs> came into effect. Um, so the first, the first case um, was specifically on, a, I'm gonna butcher this, I feel like, but Japer Gurong and Junior Ramos. 
um, there are currently, or there are part of this community, this indigenous, indigenous community uh, who are known as the Ayeta in the Philippines, right, uh, in Zambales. So this happened uh, last year in August. Um, and just to note too that uh, terrorism under section four of this uh, of this act is uh, non bailable right? Um, and then they actually held oral arguments today on uh, the validity of the anti-terror law. And it was said that these two individuals actually were, um, they were redact or they were, they were taking back their petition, right? Um, and why is that? Maybe it's because uh, they're using like the, you know, these uh, cronies are using fear mongering tactics to intimidate these people, right? Um, but that's again, speculation. Um, <laughs> so next slide, please. And then also, um, oh, this is not, yeah. So the anti-terror law abroad, meaning here in the US, um, here's another case is our uh, national chairperson, Adrian, um, has been continuously uh, red tagged, right? Um, so his name and photos of, of, you know, were shared across Facebook by strangers uh, claiming that he was a terrorist, right? Um, and there are ever more increasing attempts to silence critics of this regime uh, internationally, right? Um, let's see. So, uh, for example, um, you know, delegations were sent to the UN to derail efforts to uh, hold independent investigations on uh, Philippine human rights um, violations. So, Duterte is already under speculation of the international like crime court, right? Um, but just to circle back to Adrian's case. Um, you know, being chairperson of our organization on a national level has already exposed him to um, these kinds of attacks, and this could potentially be dangerous. Um, we've seen the Philippine government time and time again uh, silence critics abroad. You know, we can go back to the Marcos regime when the Philippines was under martial law, you know, for about like what, like 15 years or something like that. Um, you know, and we have these two labor, labor activists in Washington state, Jean Viernes and Silva Domingo, who are constantly exposing the regime and, and uh, during martial law to the point to where um, these orders to have them killed were executed by the Marcos family, right? So that's just how dangerous and just to kind of like really paint the, the weight of being red tagged, right? Um, next slide, please. But yeah, so what did we do to address this, right? So an action was taken by an investigative journalist um, and uh, Facebook declared that the posts doxing Adrian did not violate any community standards. Um, instead, uh, what Facebook did was remove one of our posts um, <laughs> on our page criticizing political killings in the Philippines because online trolls um, slammed it with hateful comments, right? Um, and just to kind of uh, give people a background on, you know, Facebook and why it's so dangerous, especially in the Philippines, is because on your phone, you automatically have Facebook. And sometimes this is like people's only means of like uh, getting news, right? So a lot of misinformation is happening on that platform. And Facebook has the power to remove it. They just choose not to. And we, and this isn't the only case, not just in the Philippines, but also we've seen it happen here um, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Like we've seen it, um, you know, like domestically and like abroad, right? Like Facebook and these ultra capitalists like refuse to uh, take a stance on that, right? Um, and then I will go on the next slide, <laughs> sorry. It's still me. Okay, cool. So just to kind of like talk a little bit more on the armed forces in the Philippines and uh, the NTF LCAC, uh, specifically uh, standing for the National Task Force to end local communist armed conflict. Um, you know, this is a really dangerous thing because this is a force really orchestrating violence towards the masses, right? Um, again, red tagging leads to murder, arrests, threats, repression, ultimately to silence dissenters, right? And people need to remember too, um, you know, uh, due to all this propaganda, right? Um, this propaganda, this black propaganda towards uh, people who are continuously fighting for um, the masses, the basic needs of the masses, um, you know, they get tagged and then it leads to all these like negative repercussions, right? 
Um, so people need to remember too that, you know, there is a people's army in the countryside um, and we've had the longest um, armed rev struggle in Asia, you know, and uh, have been organizing peasants and indigenous people to solve the problem of the land. And in addition to this army, um, uh, the, the people's army have been like seeking justice to violence and abuse per perpetrated by you know, the Philippine National Police and the armed forces of the Philippines, right, through different tactical offensives, and the masses themselves have decided to take up arms in the countryside, uh, and it's not, you know, just like this machismo movement, it's composed of peasant youth, of women, indigenous folks, right, uh, to protect them from the violence that this, these fascists, like, um, uh, impose on the community, right? People who are hungry, people who uh, need need somewhere to sleep, right? Uh, people who are continuously doing this labor on the land, but not reaping the benefits, right? Not being able to eat the, the food that they harvest themselves, right? As these ultra capitalists just continue to gain money and make profit off of this. Um, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> um, Cool. So yeah, just again, the anti-terror law update, which I touched on earlier, that happened today. Um, a third meeting will be held uh, February 16th. So that's when the oral arguments would, will resume. Um, I know that today they focused on um, freedom of speech, right? A lot of people were saying that this law is not valid because it strikes that out, right? Like it really negates that, like their freedom of speech. Uh, it would restrict that uh, due to the fear of expressing dissent and it makes you vulnerable to prosecution, right? Um, but any fool, moving on from that, next slide. So again, what are we doing to take action? We are continuously exposing the role of the Philippine consulate. Like, why are y'all here in the first place if you're not gonna serve uh, diaspora Filipinos while they're experiencing um, economic crisis, right? Um, why are you acting here <laughs> if it's not to serve the people, right? Um, and then also, uh, we continuously expose the Philippine National Police outposts in the U.S. and their counterinsurgency tactics. Um, you know, their outposts are currently located in San Francisco and New York. Um, I believe it's not long until they're uh, out here in L.A., right? Um, and also, uh, we also want to take action by exposing the government's efforts in silencing activists domestically and in the Philippines, right? Uh, we want to continuously uh, emphasize the weight of this, the weight of being uh, doxxed online, right? And our Palestinian comrades can definitely attest to that as well. Um, as you can see here too, just like the violence that was like, um, uh, that was just perpetrated in the chat, right? Um, it's a very dangerous thing. It's more than just like trolls. It's more than just like, just words on, on a screen, right? Uh, there's weight to this. Absolutely. And then next slide, please. And this is why we want to emphasize, oh wait, sorry. I am going to pass it to Julian. <laughs> long live international solidarity. All. Thanks, DJ. And yes, long live international solidarity. This is our rallying call for all of you in attendance here at this event this evening. The struggle for national democracy in the Philippines is interconnected to the struggles for liberation here in the US and in Palestine. Next slide, please. And so let's go back and kind of identify those connections, um, especially between uh, Duterte and Israel. Uh, in 2014 and 2018, there were notable arms deals between Israel and the fascist Philippine government. In 2014, the Philippines purchased uh, $19.7 million worth of arms, including 28 light armored vehicles. The Philippine National Police and Israeli forces are also uh, work in tandem and receive similar training uh, in terms of counterterrorism conducted by Israeli forces. Uh, they train the Philippine National Police and other Philippine forces to conduct these same tactics against the Filipino people. An example of this is Eduardo Año, a former general and now secretary of the interior in charge of the police and local governments in the Philippines, 
was infam infamously known for administering martial law in Mindanao and was trained by both the US and Israel. Next slide, please. And then we also acknowledge that Islamophobia plays a role in state violence in the Philippines. Most notably, the largest concentration of Muslim populations in the Philippines is located in the Southern region, uh, the island of Mindanao. In response to extremism, a specific incident of the bombing of Marawi led to uh, now dictator Duterte to enact martial law in Mindanao in 2017 for up to two years. Uh, the use of martial law was justified by Islamophobia, utilized as a tool to suppress dissent in the Philippines and abroad. How does it take place here in the US? An example of this is Jerome Abba, a Muslim human rights defender who was traveling on a speaking tour, but was detained and tortured in the San Francisco airport. Next slide, please. But seeing that the Philippines and Palestine have similar struggles, uh, Filipinos express international solidarity for those struggling for liberation in Palestine. We are united in our struggle because Palestinian liberation from the Israeli settler colonial state is integral to the liberation of the Philippines from the fascist US Duterte dictatorship. We see that in, Pal in the Philippines and in Palestine are both utilized as testing grounds for policing and military tactics and both are combating the forces of US imperialism. And the US is known for supporting reactionary governments and aiding in the suppression of people-led movements all over the world. Next slide, please. And so we're here tonight on, we're here tonight to discuss the war against youth. And as Anakbayan, we are a Filipino youth and student-led organization who are battling against US imperialism. And so both here and in the Philippines, Filipino youth are treated as commodities to fulfill the interests of American imperialists who continue to exploit our labor to extract our resources, who continue to use the fascist Philippine state as their puppet to enable them to continue perpetuating this endless cycle of exploitation and violence against the Filipino masses we, as a Filipino youth, are the byproducts of capitalism, meaning that the poor conditions and violent fascist state that were directly created by US imperialism are the same conditions that force Filipinos to migrate. Many of our parents and family members are overseas Filipino workers who are forced to migrate due to the economic conditions in the Philippines. In fact, the largest export of the Philippines is our people, is our labor. And so what is the role of the Filipino youth now? We are experiencing the lack of career and job opportunities, forcing us and our families to seek work overseas. We are experiencing the negligence of the government, not investing in our education. And we in the Filipino diaspora, whose families were forced to migrate because the Philippines is such a violent state that continues to ensure its people stay poor. We are struggling here in the belly of the beast where our struggles here in the US are inseparable to the struggles happening in the Philippines, specifically the three basic problems that continue this violence against our people. These being bureaucrat capitalism, feudalism and US imperialism. These same three basic problems reinforce the fascist Philippine state, reinforce the rampant poverty and marginalization of our people. And in this current moment, the US directly funds the human rights crisis happening in the Philippines in the form of our tax dollars. As Filipino youth struggling in the imperial core, we are fighting back with the Philippine Human Rights Act, 
that demands the suspension of U.S. tax dollars that fund the violence against our Kababayan, against our people. Next slide, please. And so this leads into our current campaigns. Number one being that we are calling for the ouster of the U.S. Duterte regime. Two, we invite you all to support our campaign for providing COVID-19 relief to our community, Filipino community here in Los Angeles via the Bayanihan community response. And three, we invite you to support and endorse the Philippine Human Rights Act that will ensure the suspension of U.S. military aid to the Philippines. Next slide, please. And so our call to action is to join Anagbayan or your local anti-imperialist organization. Support and endorse the Philippine Human Rights Act, support Bayanihan community response, and continue to work together in countering and exposing state surveillance and to continue exposing the U.S pattern counterinsurgency programs all over the world. Next slide. And so you are welcome to follow Anagbay in Los Angeles for more of our agitating and informative video content. Um, you can scan the QR code on the screen and it'll take you to our Instagram. And thank you everyone for having us tonight. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, this was really, really informative. Um, so um, just to begin, sorry all, especially Celine um, for that horrible Zoom bomb um, in the chat, but thanks Akil for removing them. Um, and thanks the most to our presenters, um, ZJ, Janine and Yezen for those awesome presentations. I learned so much um, about the struggles and I'm really grateful for um, you all sharing your work and the amazing work that you've been doing. So we do have some time for questions now. So um, if you do have a question that you'd like to pose to our presenters, um, feel free to raise your hand or um, type it in the chat and we can read it for you. Okay, well, I can um, maybe get us started. I don't see any questions yet, but um, just to get us started, thanks um, Anakbayan folks. I especially appreciated your discussion um, about the importance of land. And so one of the other fights that we have in the coalition um, kind of explores data-driven policing and you know, specifically the intersection between land and policing um, and kind of big data and gentrification and you know, banishment of low-income folks, queer folks, folks of color. Um, kind of in LA specifically. And so for Anik Bayan folks, I'm wondering if you can talk um, or speak a little bit more to how land has been targeted um, and how people have been banished from indigenous lands, um, specifically in Mindanao. Um, and then also potentially speak a little bit more about the bombing of the schools that, um, that you mentioned uh, in your presentation. Thanks. Well, I definitely want to speak on, yeah, just um, uh, just them trying to, uh, so I believe like 55 Lumad schools, so the Lumad people are also an indigenous group of people in the Philippines. Um, you know, they try to shut down um, their schools in order to um, address uh, this quote unquote issue that they were um, teaching uh, ideas of like resistance, right, um, in the schools. Um, and then also, sorry, can you repeat the question? That was like really loaded. Yeah, I just would like to just know a little bit more about kind of the, you, you spoke a little bit about um, the importance of land and protecting land. And, mm -hmm. and so just if you could speak to kind of um, how indigenous communities are, um, Kind of being pulled off their land um, mm -hmm. or their land is being kind of taken from them under the guise of mm -hmm. um, counterinsurgency? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, in the guise of counterinsurgency, Janine, do you want to take this one? Because I do know that, um, what you call it? So essentially what 
happens is that like the armed forces of the Philippines are heavily concentrated in that part um, in order to protect, um, you know, the cases of like uh, land grabbing, uh, it, it, to protect, um, you know, uh, the interests of these like landlords and uh, big comprador like bourgeoisie uh, or the national like bourgeoisie right, uh, class, their interests in, um, you know, holding the land. And this is why, like, uh, you know, like, um, I'm not gonna go into like feudalism and whatnot, but like, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically what they do is they forcibly um, make these indigenous communities um, migrate or like move from uh, their land and uh, start to set up and continuously extract these resources. Um, on the land. Um, this can lead to, um, you know, um, there are like paramilitary, uh, uh, paramilitary operations that happen um, on the lands too, um, that have um, even killed like some of the folks, uh, some of the indigenous communities, right? Um, even using tactics as like uh, planting like guns on to the corpses of these kids, right? And being like, hey, this is what they're teaching in these like indigenous schools, like the Lumon schools, right? Um, using that as a basis. Um, and so, yeah, those are just some of the examples in terms of like what's happening to the indigenous communities out in the Philippines. And that's why the resistance among that community is so strong, right? Um, but anyway, I don't know, Denise, if you want to add anything? Sure, Zuder. Um, just to expand on some of the points you hit, yeah, um, they say that the Philippines is the most dangerous place for land defenders, and that's true, because uh, um, like we kind of alluded to earlier, right, the uh, Philippines is a like prime location for the extraction of natural resources, uh, and specifically um, these air regions in the Philippines that are rich in natural resources, uh, that they try to banish like indigenous peoples from, you know, land that is rightfully theirs, uh, just so giant corporations and landlords can utilize the land to fulfill their own selfish interests of creating profit. Uh, profit. And so one of the major calls in the Philippines is actually genuine land reform um, and the removal of these like comprador bourgeoisie or big monopoly capitalists who continue to violate the land, um, the remove the extraction of these greedy landlords off the land and returning the land rightfully back to indigenous peoples in the Philippines. Um, and I believe Zidri mentioned the like Lumad schools, for example, and the reasoning behind the shutdown of like Lumad schools or many indigenous schools is because uh, the Philippine government specifically is fearful that education will, you know, empower like indigenous students to learn how to fight back because that's what they're really afraid of is the people, the masses rising up to fight back and reclaim land and freedom that is rightfully theirs. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, that was really enlightening. Um, and so, um, like Akil mentioned in the chat, if you do have a question, feel free to message it to me or raise your hand and we can unmute you. I did get um, one more question. Um, is what, what were some of the differences and continuities between Spanish, Japanese, and US colonialism in the Philippines? Dang, what a loaded question. Can you repeat that again? Sorry. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. Which one, which one are we talking about? <laughs> Five minutes. What were some of the differences and continu continuities between Spanish, Japanese, and US colonial colonialism in the Philippines? So I'm sure you could write books about that. Yeah, I mean, like the Spanish used the cross and the sword to ultimately like colonize our people. And we were, <laughs> we were under um, Spanish rule for 333 years, right? Um, and then we can look at uh, Japanese occupation as well, um, which I believe, what was that? It was like, what, like four years or something like that under like Japanese occupation. Um, and then also, you know, we could look at um, the comfort women, right, during that time as well, um, just highlighting that. And then also, oh yeah, right after the Spanish, sorry, I missed the US. 
because they bought us for $20 million, right? Uh, there was this uh, thing called the Philippine-American War, which was a cute little theatrical fiasco. Uh, basically, President Aguinaldo at the time um, was able to sell us for $20 million. And that is how the US, uh, uh, pretty much we became like a colony under, under the United States, right? And them not giving us or recognizing our true so or recognizing Philippine sovereignty, not up until like 1946. Um, so those are some of the difference, I guess, I don't know if that like highlighted some of the differences or if that answered your question, but um, Janine, do you have anything to add to the cute little timeline I just did? Uh, yeah, thank you, ZJ. And yeah, that is a loaded question. And actually, we have a specific study called Philippine Society and Revolution, which covers the whole history of the Philippines, including the history of imperialism in the Philippines. But to, thank you, ZJ, for that brief summary. And I think just to kind of hit like those key points about like, specifically, why does imperialism happen in the Philippines, right? Why does the Philippines suffer from imperialism? And one, it's because of the extraction of resources, right? And two, it is a key geopolitical location, especially in that um, Eastern region. And three, it's also a key location where a lot of people and labor is available. So it's ex the exploitation of labor is also key to the reasons why imperialists target the Philippines. And so I noticed the question cited, um, like Spanish, American, and uh, Japanese imperialism, but we also are currently suffering from Chinese imperialism, which is currently grabbing resources in the West Philippine Sea. So just to name a few. Yeah, some of y'all know it as the South China Sea, but it's not that. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah. Great, thank you all. Um, so maybe we'll take, um, Another question, uh, I think Hamid has a question. Yeah, I think this question goes to both uh, uh, ZJ, Janine, and uh, Yazan as well. Uh, that one of the things that the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition we've been doing is been exposing uh, the scale of uh, intelligence gathering and information sharing, not just within the United States as well, but within uh, through the National Counterterrorism Center between uh, uh, countries and agencies as well, which is not which is not just only limited to Interpol, but an active uh, act of uh, everyday information sharing, both on um, on uh, uh, counterterrorism, but also political activists here in the United States or in Palestine or in the Philippines. So, uh, so maybe uh, from both of your organizational vantage points, have you all uh, looked into that? to the scale of that information sharing or, and, and if so, uh, what have been some of the challenges uh, in exposing that or finding out uh, through, especially through these uh, hubs of information uh, gathering and storing and sharing called fusion centers and various other agencies too. So, yeah. So whoever wants to go first. Thank you, Lauren. Um, really quickly, if it's okay to answer, um, I think one thing that's really important is, um, so there's fusion centers and then there's uh, JTTFs, Joint Terrorist Task Forces. Um, the United States opened their first transnational JTTF in Kenya last year. Um, and that's coming with the expansion of uh, peacekeeping uh, militarization. Um, and that JTTF then would be working with um, organizations, nonprofits and US military that were contracted to do CVE programming. Um, and so I think, Hamid, to your question, um, I guess this is more talking about the mechanism of information sharing, but like the first thing that came was the expansion of US militarization of East Africa and then the expansion of CVE programming. So specifically nonprofits through the United Nations working to isolate women from their families um, to do women's services or things like that. Um, and then, in addition to that, those CVE contracts are through local governments in Kenya. For example, um, Kenya is a site, not because of Kenya itself, but because of its proximity to Somalia, um, so Al-Shabaab. Um, but then that installation of JTTF is targeting um, Al-Shabaab. 
And so it's about um, what they cited it as was a streamlining of information collection and then also policing and militarization. Um, so that's just something that I was thinking about. Um, like, I think the US infrastructure of surveillance and like when we think of JTTFs and fusion centers, I know that they do different things, but I'm, I, I don't know, I guess for me, like it's really significant to think about the fact that they decided to formally build a JTTF in another country. Um, it's a big deal um, because I think it speaks to the expansion of those um, technologies. And then also really fast, um, ZJ earlier mentioned Facebook um, and what stances Facebook is taking, but I actually think it's also really important. Um, I took a class in the Department of Homeland Security Department at SDSU because they let me sit in on it. Um, and it was on um, open source information. Um, and so with this professor, he's actually FBI in Orange County. Um, and what his work focuses on is he's one of the major people who's leading the um, streamlining of federal agents accessing open source information um, and using that as part of the tools to um, monitor and surveil organizers or things like that. So um, something that's really important for countering violent extremism is the reason the United States government needs countering violent extremism is because if nonprofits or religious institutions report on community members or if the government accesses community members through these parties, there's no longer a need for a warrant. So there's no privacy breach anymore. And um, DHS wrote this down in the report in 2020. They said that CVE is an integral tool for us because it circumvents privacy rights. And Facebook is a great example of this. Um, the United States government relies really heavy on partnerships with social media um, outlets like Instagram, like Facebook, like these folks places, which I know we know they're not safe, but I think what's really interesting is right now, the United States government is in a phase of streamlining their communications with these social media platforms because there is not a streamlined um, protocol for how information is shared or accessed. Right now, for every individual website, depending on a region like Southwest, Northwest, whatever, um, the federal government will be able to access, they'll have their own backend login to Facebook and they'll be able to sift through information they're interested in depending on Facebook's agreements with them. So it's very much the social media um, platform's choice, but it's not a streamlined thing across the United States. And it's something that the United States government is working really hard to shift because it really slows down their surveillance um, capabilities. And so I guess I'm naming that because there is a lot of information that's shared. Um, like Facebook is one of the major tools used in Palestine to arrest um, anti-Zionist agitators. Um, but it's, it's all because the Zionist entity, right? Israel has a really, really, really streamlined authoritarian approach to comms. Um, or if we think of other places, whereas the US is so massive and so decentralized that the US government hasn't been able to successfully do that in the same way. So they do have that access. Um, I don't know if this is too like niche of an example, but I think it's really relevant because a lot of open source information is usually what leads to the incrimination of activists and organizers. And a lot of the circumvention of privacy rights is how they're able to do that. Um, but that's what they're working on doing. And that's the major flaw that policy analysts have identified with the United States ability to enact counterterrorism or countering violent extremism is that it's decentralized, it's not streamlined. And because of that, it's ineffective. Whereas Nadia had named prevent, prevent is a nationalized thing. It's standardized because the country has standardized healthcare, which makes it much easier. Um, anyway, sorry, these are just random thoughts and response, thinking about information collection and where the government is at with different things. Thank you all so much. Um, I have just one more question in the chat and then um, we'll probably move on to our next activity. Um, but could um, anyone really just speak broadly to the role of women and how they're both affected um, and how um, kind of, the U.S. uses Muslim women to further um, CVE programs. So I think that might be related to um, some of the stuff you brought up earlier, Yezin, about um, uh, like the Woman Peacemaker Program, I think is what that was getting at. Yeah, um, so a great place to start is if you want to look up, um, it's, I'll type it in the chat. It's really easy to remember. It's called Women, Peace and Security. Um, and it's in the United States, we have a law that we passed in 2017 
that's a policy called Women, Peace and Security. The United Nations has it as well and many countries have adopted it. Um, but that's the umbrella where women are identified as integral figures in peacemaking. Um, so the reason that the university I named, the University of San Diego has that program is because of this initiative which started in the early 2000s. And basically the framework and a really simplistic thing is women, because of the role historically that women have played in resistance movements. So if we think of Algeria, right? Two thirds of the anti-colonial bombings were done by women. Um, women have been identified as really, really important facilitators of um, radical resistance. So what this does is they've noticed in recent times that there are more and more women who've been joining our militia groups across the world. So especially anti-imperialist militias, they've said women are vulnerable to being um, co-opted by terrorists. Women are vulnerable to violence from men. We need to protect women from violence. We need to protect women from DV. So they'll actually use DV and other gender-based violence frameworks to say, let's save women by getting them into our communities. And then also the other part of it, which is super sexist and basic and essentialist is women are mothers and women raise children. And so women can play a role in raising people to not be terrorists. Um, so there's a lot of funding, a lot of funding that specifically goes into targeting women um, all over the world. So if you think of that example I named here in SD, there's like 15 more just in San Diego like that. There are programs in refugee camps in Syria and Lebanon that target Palestinian women. And part of the coding is we'll teach you a vocational skill, but also if you hear your brother or your husband or your son talk about how he's frustrated with Zionism, tell us that. And so women are, are encouraged to police their community members. And they're, it's actually in their programming to learn about how do I hear language that sounds radical and how do I go back and tell my UN program coordinator about it? Um, and so it's, it's like this pseudo feminist thing, like the war in Afghanistan, let's save women. Um, but it's actually because they also want to um, demobilize women who have always played such an active role. Um, so women will either be terrorists or they'll be really vulnerable passive victims who need to be saved from terrorism. Wow, thank you all so much um, for those amazing um, responses to the question and presentations. Um, we really appreciate your time and um, learn so much. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Akil to lead us in an activity. Hi everyone. So first of all, how amazing were, there, were those presentations? I was just blown away and learning so much. Oh, Selena, I also think my computer's working. I spilled water on my computer earlier while I was teaching a class of middle schoolers. So hopefully everything will work let me, out. Let me know. Yeah, I'll let you know. Let me know if it doesn't. Okay. Um, so, oh yeah, the first thing, yeah, check out in the chat. Nadia just posted what our next working meeting is. This is a chance to actually get more like personally involved in the fight and what we're currently working on and help us figure out strategy, social media, outreach plans, um, popular education tools, et cetera. Um, so feel free to message us or you can fill out the campaign interest form, which is right here. Um, also, I had no idea that the Bay Area police were training the forces in the Philippines and the deadly exchange is so much more than just US and Israel, you know? So it's just um, fascinating to learn about. Anyway, so the thing that we're gonna do now for the last 28 minutes is um, a collective reading and analysis of a section of the Army Field Manual on Counterinsurgency. And there's actually three different field manuals on counterinsurgency I found, but this, this third one, the most recent one, has a whole section called generational engagement, which is basically the Ar Army's counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency plan when it has to do with youth <clears throat> and specifically what they call indirect methods of counterinsurgency. So how to do it either before or during or after when the, the insurgency is most, um, you know, I guess hot, but like how to do it in a, in a circumstance where the insurgency is still just developing as well. So I actually, uh, my current plan for this is I wanted to share a couple of graphics that I found and then maybe we could do a, a read out loud um, where if you are interested and able to read out loud, could you um, just um, put your name in the chat and maybe Hamid at this point, we can open up the chat cautiously in case, you know, 
We removed that one Zoom, Zoom bomber, but we can keep an eye on the chat as well. And if you're interested in participating in the Read Out Loud and being one of the popcorn readers, you can put your name in the chat and um, we can allow you to unmute. And then um, uh, the other thing we were gonna do is, you know, if you wanted to just put your comments in in the chat, we can read it out loud as well. But I wanted to ground this first in um, a paragraph that I found at the beginning of the field manual, which is all about legitimacy. And this is kind of what they say is their, their central goal in counterinsurgency. So I'll just read out loud. These are just some three different quotes from the first section, all about legitimacy. So it says, legitimacy, the acceptance of an authority by a society and control are the central issues in insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. And then it says, um, legitimacy can be seen as the willing acceptance of a government by its population. Counterinsurgency forces may achieve this objective by the balanced application of both military and non-military means. Governments rule through a combination of consent and coercion. An illegitimate government's only method of controlling its population is coercion, which can be resource intensive. A legitimate government has to use coercion for policing power, but its population in general sees the rules and directions of its government as intrinsically correct. And then just to compare, this is a paragraph from the LAPD's most recent strategy, the, the Data Informed Community Focused Policing Handbook, which they released, which by the way, if you're in, in, interested in getting involved more to figure out what they're doing, message Lauren who helps to lead the, the fight all about combating the data enforced, data informed community focused policing handbook. But just con for comparison, racial and ethnic minorities may perceive the police as lacking lawfulness and legitimacy based in part on their interactions with the police or other influences, social media, news stories, et cetera. This can lead to distrust of the police which has serious consequences for law enforcement. Lack of trust equates to illegitimacy of police authority which in turn leads to an inability for the police to function effectively. So this first one came out in 2014 and this last one was, it, I think it was 2019 that the, the, this handbook came out, but maybe um, Lauren can correct. Um, so just, just to get us thinking about um, the role of legitimacy in counterinsurgency, um, if you have any uh, initial thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. And then I wanna bring up this diagram and just get people's um, thoughts about this. This diagram was in the field manual in their section about how to engage youth. And this is, you know, so I, I want everybody to look at the screen and I can maybe like present this. And what are your first thoughts? Yeah, this is exactly yes. And what are your first thoughts about what this might be trying to express? I'm also trying to figure it out. So this is the generational engagement diagram. You can put it in the chat and we can read it out loud or you can um, raise your hand and we can unmute you. Oh, oh, wait, let me change it. So Adam, can you try one more time if you were trying to? Maybe now everybody can post in the chat. Thank you for pointing that out. Awesome. By the way, I wanna just give credit that um, the idea for this, I, I was listening to some interview with um, Dylan Rodriguez, who we got to feature in one of our meetings last month. Um, and he said that everybody who's involved in this work should check out the field manual as well. So um, yeah, Steve, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about this? You said compare to Sarah. Sarah. If you want, you can, um, whoops. Wasn't anticipating speaking, but the, in the handbook, they use the SARA model. The acronym escapes me right now. I have to look it up. But it's the same it's kind of iter of decision making. Uh, they've turned it into a machine. There's no, there's no real analysis here, although they apply it. But it's very similar to the SARA model uh, in, the, in the handbook. Uh, it, it, if someone has that, e, uh, they could pop it up fairly easy. And I can't remember what page it's on, but I can get back to you if you need that, okay. that's all. Yeah. Yeah, I think Lauren's group has been studying Sarah as well in the handbook. So um, what are words on this diagram that jump out at you as well? 
words that seem kind of like they're important to you and how you've experienced policing as well? Well, one thing that jumps out just to me is, is what's interesting how, yeah, it's all kind of the arrow is heading to the reduces violence. Um, and just, you know, thinking about the context of this, obviously, like this is developed for the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. Like, so when we're talking about, like when, you know, these programs are then trying to think about how do we reduce violence in the context of the, you know, imperial occupation, they're thinking about, oh, we need to like increase voting and town meetings and all this stuff. Um, and, and, you know, that's obviously kind of jarring to think about in that context when the violence is, is this military invasion. But um, yeah, as we think about how this applies to our context and, and um, you know, the same idea of let's, we need to fund youth programs and those pillars at the bottom, education, empowerment, participation, um, also in this obviously same, you know, of part of a broader project of, of physical violence and occupation. Mm. Oh, so we have a hand up uh, from Jams. Yes, thank you. Um, what I find interesting is kind of like the language being used. Uh, for example, um, education is also part of the political mobilization of the movement as well as one of the generational engagements and then empowerment and participation. To be honest, this graphic is not as clear because it has these pillars on the bottom. And it's, I guess it's like trying to draw like the basis of what this is gonna lead to, which is reducing violence. But it is also inherently using these like education and youth programs and town meetings as a way to identify folks. So I don't know, I, I honestly, this is the first time I've seen a graphic like this. And it it seems like it's just like wo like words put in there um, that that like I mean it's very like ad adopting language of folks that are like either like I don't know I don't know it's I don't know it's just it's weird. Yeah, I like that you were noticing. I in, I agree that it's kind of adopting these languages of pe people actually struggling for justice, like empowerment, participation, but in the context of you know, what kind of participation are they trying to get people to do? If they're trying to get people to, youth specifically to participate in a different way than, it, than the insurgency. And also I see um, we have comments from Nicholas and Charles in the chat. If either of you want to um, speak also, feel free to raise your hand. I can also read it out loud. What Nicholas posted is, um, what jumps out to me is a reversal of Clausewitz's um, famous dictum. Instead of war is politics by other means, politics is war by other means. Wow, yeah. A war waged through political power. Politics equals voting, education, youth programs, town meetings. In other words, what is the, the that they're, they're putting this in a war manual. They're putting, trying to get, yeah, exactly. So they're waging war through getting youth more involved in politics. And then Charles says, relevant this analysis from early July, the pacification of the BLM uprising as a counterinsurgency operation. And then Ariana says, I just find it telling that education is all over it. Obviously a skewed education and benefit imperialist agendas. Yeah. And then just for comparison, I wanted to show this next slide, which is, whoops, I'm gonna go back one. This is the counter, the CVE. Oh, and then Lauren, let me just read out Lauren's. Reminds me of the benevolent assimilation in the Philippines and winning over hearts and minds or the velvet glove over the iron fist. Wow. And then here's, for comparison, here's a DHS graphic about CVE. So you can see some of the similar language and similar goals, but let's look at, let's take a second to look at this for comparison. Ha, <laughs> I like Yazen's comment in the chat. They got a budget for a designer for this one. One thing that's jumping out to me is trust in police and government right here. And you see education here too. 
And access to services. Mm, access to services right here is one of them. Yeah. But also it's an example of how uh, the, the movement language, uh, movements for liberation keeps on getting co-opted and gets incorporated into the states and uh, you know language as well to be normalized as a and it's it's all a part of the psychological warfare psychops where the familiarity of these terms mm -hmm. creates uh, a comfort zone as well right right absolutely disarming yeah, yeah. i wanted to to add to that too um you know that's one of the the components um you know of cve right is is sort of adapting and shifting, not like so co-opting language, but also changing, right? Like knowing that when there are, um, you know, when there are movements building against it, you know, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, actually has a memo in which it says once people start building a resistance and are opposing, you know, anything like CVE, we just have to shift and change its name. So. Um, so yeah, just uh, with, with what Hamid said, it, it made me think of that as well. So it's like not only the co-optation, but then also the, the shifting that happens. Also, we have a comment. Thank you, Nadia. We have a comment in the chat that says, also the communication only goes one direction, no place for community input. So it's anti-dialogic and anti frarian Fairy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also, look at this corny success thing right here. I'm gonna show one last one before we start actually reading out loud, which is the CSP one. So just for context, whoops, this is the wrong one. I'm sharing the wrong presentation. Give me one second. This is the CSP one right here. So for context for people who might, might be new, the Community Safety Partnership Program is an LAPD counterinsurgency program that they have been engaged in for about a decade recently became incorporated as this official bureau of the LAPD. Um, and it involves embedding uh, cops in certain communities, uh, started off with housing projects and now it's focusing also on certain parks um, in um, definitely poor and working class black and brown neighborhoods, especially Watts. And, um, and oftentimes it basically gets the cops to do social programs and stay there for a long time to quote unquote build relationships with the community and um, ultimately to surveil and police them. So this is one of the diagrams I found from a report by the Urban Peace Institute about the CSP program. So what are some similarities that are jumping out for this one to the counterinsurgency one as well? The improved perception of quality of life. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, it is. As Nick is saying, it's it's absolutely a broken windows policing. Uh, yeah. And I see one that says um, DHS is a primary partner in joint funded law enforcement NGO human trafficking tra trafficking task forces. How likely is it that some of this surveillance is happening in those networks? And then um, uh, another, that was from West. And then Adam says, right, all the activities and outputs on the DHS side and the activities list here are all about how to gather info on communities through engagement. Oh, and then Jam says legitimacy is brought up here too. Yeah. And Ariana says youth programming is a policing activity. Yeah. Legitimacy, yeah, absolutely. Increased legitimacy right here is one of the outcomes. And just in this past one, they also said, um, they also said trust in police and um, yeah. So positive attitudes about tolerance and nonviolence. There's some parallels, yeah. They also, um, it says proactive problem solving. And that's something that they list a lot in PVE and CVE is like they claim that they're gonna help youth learn how to problem solve because the real problem is that youth don't know how to address issues instead of youth are like constantly facing state violence or these things. Like it's really um, gaslighty. Mm. <laughs> 
Yeah, improve perception and quality of life. And then I don't know how to pronounce it. It might be Jamilet says, um, I see positivity being used. Uh huh. And then Steve says, and they are defining the community by policing. The community is not allowed to define itself. And a lot of folks who are shutting down activists. Perception was also used in the Black Identity Extremist Report. Yeah. So with this, we have about 10 minutes left and we won't have time to read through the whole thing, but I was thinking we could read through a couple sections of the generational engagement. Um, uh, and then as we're reading through it, uh, some of the things I would love to hear people think about is what are the parallels you can draw? Oh, sorry, this is, we already did this. So how does this general engage, engagement section relate to your own experience and knowledge of how youth and communities of color are being policed and surveilled? And then also how can we learn from the state strategy in fighting back? So I'm gonna actually send everybody the link to the field manual itself. And then also to a doc that I made that has the field manual and the graphics in case you want to learn from it later. And this doc that I made also not only has the field manual it has all three field manuals um, that I was able to find. So, um, sorry, is LB Long Beach? Um, I'm not sure, oh yeah, so this is a federal, this is the army field manual, just to clarify. Um, so, so basically I sent this doc and um, this has the, the uh, language from the generational engagement section. Um, and it also has the links to the three different field manuals here. And then at the very bottom, it also has the graphics in case you wanted to, to look more in detail at them later. Um, oh yeah, I'm going to add, I should add the header. Actually, you know, Celine, if you want, you can, um, you're also shared as an editor on the documents. You can add the header, the, the um, header as well. Do that right now. Okay, so um, while Celine does that, I think what we should do right now is actually just um, uh, read out loud a couple sections here and then have a little bit of time for discussion because I don't think we'll have time to get through the whole section. But one that I think that would be really interesting is these, principles that they say are fundamental to generational engagement. So um, do we have a volunteer? Um, you can either raise your hand or you can um, unmute yourself if you're already a co-host to start off with these principles of generational engagement. We've actually opened it up for folks to unmute themselves. Okay, cool. I can start the reading. If Thank anything. you. This is EJ. Um, just go over the three principles right here. So there's five here, and then I think we should jump down and look at some of their examples of what they did in Afghanistan and uh, Vietnam. That's just my personal suggestion, but yeah. Um, maybe if we wanna start with this, these principles. Word, all right. So generational engagement. Uh, five principles are fundamental to generational engagement. Groups with whom counterinsurgents partner uh, such as non-governmental organizations, also known as NGOs, must be seen as indigenous, not as foreign constructs. Um, independence of funding and resources are important. Uh, support groups can lose credibility uh, the more they are perceived as solely reliant on foreign funding, possibly due to a shift in priorities by a sole and influential benefactor. Organizations and their partners should identify alternative um, uh, alternatives, uh, sources of support, uh, including local sponsors, funding from the relevant ministries, or collecting dues from members. Um, in selecting partners, counterinsurgents should not limit themselves to the vocal and intellectual elite. If the insurgency is based on the root causes of a rural population, intellectual elites might not have legitimacy, legitimacy among the rural poor. Therefore, counterinsurgents should balance support between the central leadership and the local branches in the provinces or townships uh, where youth engagement is usually most important. So first, what are, um, what are your thoughts, uh, people, about um, this, about this idea that like who the counterinsurgents took? In this case, counterinsurgents is the US state, right? And they're talking about who they're partnering with in 
the places they're occupying, but we can even expand from that and say, obviously they're occupying this land as well. So when we think about the nonprofits and the, and the community organizations they cultivate as partners, how does this trigger any kinds of, um, you know, your own experiences with policing here? Oh, go for it. Um, I see a raised hand from Jim. Sorry, can you, um, when you unmute, can you um, let us know how to pronounce your name? Jamilet. Jamilet, thank you. Um, so what I'm seeing is uh, they kind of rely, well, basically what, because there's so much like, like already broken trust with uh, like the government, right? Um, and just in general, like state um there's not trust right with community members they're branched on to the nonprofits because like you've, it's already been mentioned right people that are like refugees or migrants or undocumented folks um, who are here they do rely on nonprofits to get services or any resources that they cannot get from like the state basically so i think that um with seeing that they've branched out to organizations and to nonprofits it, it just comes to show that they're seeing the way that I guess nonprofits are also functioning it and using it as a tool to further expand their reach to community members that are most vulnerable and needing of these resources. So I think it's uh, trust has been one of the biggest things that I've also learned um, that has continuously been brought up in like, for example, I'm bringing like Long Beach as an example um, because we found out that license plate readers were sharing directly data with ICE. Um, and then, you know, again, trust was broken in addition to other times that has been broken. So I'm seeing that trust has been like a barrier for them to access to these community members. And so they're using organizations that have built that trust and that know, have the resources um, to monopolize it and then also continue to um, access community members that are refusing to be accessible by the state. Absolutely. And we have I'm Go sorry, I was just going to say we also have Nick's hand up. Sorry, sorry about that. Go for it, Nick. Yeah, the previous speaker pretty much covered it, but uh, just relating it to here, because um, I was reading an article by Christian Williams, The Other Side of Coin, but uh, he talks about Oscar Grant and uh, basically how progressive organizations and the Black clergy, these kind of liberal figureheads, serve to pacify uh, political anger uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the killing of Oscar Grant, and they really... Um, if they had heeded to their demands, nothing would have, uh, well, nothing was done, but uh, you know, it would have just gone by the wayside. So I think these liberal groups really play a, a key role in pacification and counterinsurgency and diffusing anger. Absolutely. And I, I wanna um, quickly highlight one sentence right here, which is also specifically about youth. Um, generational engagement works with factions from a population to get them to see the benefit of participating in, a peaceful, in peaceful means to address their core grievances. Getting youths to understand the, le the legal means they have to address root causes of conflict is a critical tool for reducing violence. Um, so I think that since we only have three minutes left, I think what would be good is I, I shared, oh, and also I wanna read out loud Adam's comment too, which is that, just the language is so gross. I think of how Jamie G from the coalition talks about how they pathologize communities. Like they aren't talking about human beings, but about this thing that needs to be controlled. Thank you, Adam. Um, with the two minutes that we have left, I think what uh, I wanna make sure everybody has this document so you can look at it later. Um, I'm gonna post it in chat one more time. And then also we have our campaign interest form so please fill this out um, if you're interested in um, doing work with us to combat these programs. Um, and then also our next, our working meeting is next Wednesday at 6 p.m. So um, you can send Celine, Nadia, or me um, your contact information if you wanna come. Uh, and um, any last thoughts about what you read? Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to go through it at all, but I think it was for the better because the presentations were so important. I wanted to soak in every minute of that from earlier. So any last thoughts in the last two minutes? 
I think one quick last thought, uh, uh, Akhil, is that, uh, you know, that's why one of the things that the coalition is very clear about is the role of advocacy and reform work. Uh, that is what the nonprofit industrial complex has really moved to keep on hovering and, and keep on creating this vicious circle to keep people within the system. Um, and so that's that to me is a very clearly sort of a counterinsurgency, uh, uh, you know, just just byproduct as well and, and an intentional uh, sort of activity that, uh, you know, how do we keep uh, people just seeking and trying to find a place in this highly oppressive system. So, yeah. <laughs> I like Steve's comment that, that the people in the NGO should be here listening. <laughs> oh, and then Hamid, did you have an announcement as well? Yeah, I just want to, uh, uh, first of all, thank everybody. This was a brilliant, uh, just an awesome uh, conversation and learned a lot. And thank you to our uh, uh, guests from uh, Anak Bayan and, and, and PYM. Um, I just wanted to announce that next Tuesday is uh, our general meeting. But next Tuesday, we will be talking about the, the role of artificial intelligence uh in uh, and its impact on the communities we have invited uh, a person who just wrote a book called artificial whiteness uh their name is yarden katz uh, which really goes into that how all of these technologies are really promoting white supremacy we will also have uh one of our community members our coordinating team member craig roberts uh who's a schedule resident who's going to be part of that conversation so you know just and we are trying to get another person um, Tim at uh, Gebru as well to see if they can be a part of the panel too. So that'll be next Tuesday and the information is going to be available on the, on the website. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you to all, everybody who participated in the discussion at the end, either through the chat or out loud. That was awesome. Yes, thank you all. Wishing you a great night. Thank you again. Much love, PYM and Anak Bay. Yeah, thank you for joining us and you know being our partners in this work. Thank you all. It's good thank to hang you. out. I'll be coming next Wednesday, um, and I'll see if I can get out of a meeting to come Tuesday because that sounds way more fun than the meeting I have lined up. <laughs> awesome. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, let's work together again soon. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like we need to, <laughs> to meet. Yeah. <laughs> let's set it up. Yeah, let's do it. DJ has, right. um, <laughs> Are you about to cook something? Oh, I'm cooking right now. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you have a good night everyone bye <laughs> okay. thanks bye dj bye everyone yeah.